This is actually a two for the price of one video because we're actually going to look at two telescopes here. That's the Skyhawk 114 and the Skyhawk 1145P. Now this is because the two telescopes actually look identical. So everything I'm going to say about the mechanics of the telescope and what you get in the kit and everything else is the same for both the 114 and the 1145P. Um, a little bit later on I'm going to deal with the optical differences because that's where there's a difference in the optical configuration between the 114 and the 1145P where the differences actually lie. Let's kick off first with a sort of ground up uh, look at what you get in the kit. You get a good sized aluminium field tripod with the uh, 114 combination. Um, it's a nice size for both adult usage and also child usage as, as well. We've got it not on full maximum height here at the moment. I've got it a couple of inches off maximum height. Uh, you can see the, uh, the, the leg locks down here. It finishes in garden spikes uh, at the bottom of the leg down here. Um, you can set it up on, a, on, a, on an ordinary hard floor uh, without any difficulties and the legs are stretched into position with a, an accessory tray rather usefully positioned at the midpoint here and obviously uh, the telescope mounting, the German equatorial mount sits on top. But you can see the uh, position of the telescope. It's quite useful for uh, both ad adult usage and also parent-child observing teams. That brings us up to the German equatorial mount. Um, that is one of the things about this telescope that I find uh, really very impressive. This is nothing new, this mount. They've been making this uh, in this configuration, the EQ1, uh, for really a few decades now. And it really is a well-made uh, product. It's all metal construction throughout. I think you can see when you look at the, uh, the quality of the engineering and the durability of this, it looks like something that would consume the uh, purchase price of the telescope. Uh, on its own with the tripod without really looking at the telescope at all. So that's very reassuring. I, I, I think it's nice to get very good value for money today and I think you're definitely getting that with the EQ1 German equatorial mount. Now the critical thing about uh, this mounting is its ability to be co-aligned with the North Celestial Pole. That's this axis right here. Uh, the real achievement uh, that the polar alignment is going to give you is that when you turn this single knob the telescope is able to track targets in the night sky very easily. So the moment you're looking at a target at, at, uh, at high power, you're going to be able to keep it in the eyepiece by simply turning this one knob. You haven't got to do a magic trick, you know, uh, turning two knobs at a time. Once you've got the target in the field of view, you can just turn this one knob very slowly and the target will stay in the field of view. Now obviously that's great uh, in giving you uh, an opportunity to study the target in great detail. So that's a very important part about the Skyhawk 114 is it comes with this very good quality German equatorial mounting. The parts that you can see here, I'll just tick them off, this is the uh, right ascension gear, so this is the part that you actually turn, the knob that you turn to compensate for the Earth's rotation. This one is allowing you to uh, steer the telescope tube in declination so that you can uh, center the target and that kind of thing. Other things we've got on here, the basic locks. This knob at the back here enables you to t uh, tilt the attitude. I might be able to just show you that by just slackening it off. Uh, if I turn it off, can you see it going down there as I turn that back? So that's allowing you to lock the position of the mounting. Uh, when you're actually getting the polar alignment of the telescope. This lump at the front here is actually a counterbalance weight, counterbalancing the weight of the optical tube at the top here. We've got some uh, setting circles on the mount. I'm going to be absolutely blunt with you and say I don't think they're an awful lot of use. It's very common to find this type of telescope with these very small scale, difficult to read uh, setting circles do not actually expect them to be that accurate but the good news is the telescope is equipped with a really good modern electronic red dot finder and that really is an easy tool to use and it makes pointing the telescope very very easy. Just a quick word about the red dot finder. The way this seems to work is to actually project a red dot on, on the sky. You co-align the position of the dot with the view that you get in a low powered eyepiece so that when you put the dot over the target you want to look at the target will actually be in the eyepiece. It's a very simple procedure. Um, it doesn't actually project anything at all. What you're actually doing is when you're, when you're looking through the back of the telescope including the red dot finder in your field of view it's a bit like the head-up display in a, in a jet aircraft. It's giving you the impression that the red dot is projected on the sky. In actual fact it's it's just something you can see in your eye. It's just an, it just is an optical illusion, as it were, that it's actually projected onto the sky. But very, 
very easy to use. You do need to remember to switch it off though. That's one little thing. You do actually need to remember to switch that off. Although this is pretty much a, an entry-level telescope, it's been designed to appeal very much to the first time uh, astronomical user. The manufacturer is kind of assuming you've probably never had a telescope before when you when you buy this uh, tel uh, this instrument because it comes with everything you need like eyepieces and that kind of thing but there are some very nice accessories you can get for it and I think this shows the pedigree of the instrument that there's actually a very good motor drive system that you can get for this telescope that simply fits onto the mount here and instead of you having to turn this knob to track targets in the night sky it will actually do it for you it will actually um, clock drive the mount, uh, the uh, the telescope, so that effectively, it's kind of difficult to understand this one. The telescope stands still. So what the motor is actually going to do is extract the rotation of the Earth, so that the telescope stands still relative to the target. If you can you can follow that idea. So telescope stands still, allowing you to get a really good high powered view of the target. Um, the mount and the planet underneath you is turning, but the motor is keeping the telescope absolutely steady relative to the target. I'm just going to show you how this uh, actually fits onto the telescope. Uh, first of all, I'll just show you its, uh, its detail here. Um, we've got a uh, north and south switch at the top here. I think that's fairly obvious. If you're in the northern hemisphere, uh, you would leave it switched to the north position. And if you're in the southern hemisphere, you'd switch it to S. And we've got a simple on and off switch. The trimmer here is actually just a little part, a little potentiometer, that lets you control the overall speed of the um, motor. So it's basically set to the sidereal rate of the rotation of the Earth, uh, but you can actually speed it up a little and slow it down a little. It's not much. It's just to make sure that the, the tracking rate actually stays stabilized in the, uh, in the eyepiece field. This is quite useful because the moon actually shows true proper motion and not motion only caused by the apparent uh, motion caused by the rotation of the Earth. So it's actually quite a useful little gadget. And there's a red LED when it's actually running. Very unusual feature of this motor system is it actually takes two batteries but only needs one of them to actually function. You can fit the battery onto either of the uh, terminals here. That's a very unusual feature and basically just so that you can get um, a longer runtime out of it by employing two batteries rather than one. I'm not sure I've ever come across that before on anything. Something that allows you to fit more batteries than uh, are necessary. It's really quite a nice idea I think. Anyway, I've got the batteries inside and you can see that uh, I can show it working. Okay, all we do to actually set it going is to remove the slow motion handle, remove this little screw at the side here, and introduce the uh, connector and spin it around to the right position and simply put this screw in here. I need to do that up with an Allen key, but you get the idea. Um, the, the screw now um, simply fits, sorry, the uh, handle, slow motion handle, simply fits on the other side. And if you want to disconnect the motor at any point uh, during your observing session, you can simply undo the lock screw there and you can move the telescope around manually. And when you're done, simply re-engage the screw again and uh, off you go. That really is a very useful feature. Um, you can even use it for very basic photography by mounting a camera at the top here. Do bear in mind though, the mounting and the motor system combined probably hasn't got the authority to be able to take photographs through the main tube, at least not photographs that are tracked and uh, in involve the, uh, the uh, retraction of the Earth's rotation. So you would be only putting a camera on the back here with a wide angle lens. You also get some accessories included in the kit as well in the form of a 25 millimeter eyepiece, a 10 millimeter eyepiece, and also the very useful Barlow lens that actually doubles the focal length of the telescope and thereby doubles the, the uh, power of any eyepiece you actually use with it. Um, one of the good things about the Skyhawk um, is that it has a inch and a quarter eyepiece holder allowing you to upgrade the optics uh, very easily. There's lots of other eyepieces and filters and that kind of thing that you can use uh, with the telescope. A couple of other little features that I kind of like about the uh, Skyhawk. On the uh, top of the mounting ring here we've actually got a mounting point for a camera. That's quite a nice idea. Um, would allow you to do um, very simple tracked photography with a fairly wide angle lens. To be honest, bearing in mind the limitations of this relatively modest mounting, um, you won't be able to attempt 
um, guided or tracked photography uh, for any, anything more than a few minutes using a probably a DS, DSLR with a fairly wide angle lens, maybe a 35mm or a 28mm or something like that. This is a Newtonian reflector, so I'm going to take the front cap off. And you can see straight away it looks like a brolly stand. Uh, don't put your umbrellas in it, that's not a good idea. But if I point that at the camera, hopefully you can see the mirror uh, gleaming at you down the bottom there. That's the primary mirror. That's actually mounted at the back of the telescope, right down the bottom here. And if you can see this little spidery uh, arrangement at the front here with the three veins on it, this is a holder for a secondary mirror. Uh, this is arranged at uh, 45 degrees and actually kicks the image from the mirror out through the side of the tube. So the light path here is the light goes uh, down the tube in, and is unmodified uh, for the first trip down the tube, modified and bent by the mirror, brought to a focus. That focus is shunted out through the side here and the eyepiece is applied at this point so that you can then place your eye there and view the target. So that's a Newtonian reflector. Now, I said I would deal with this, the difference between the two telescopes, and this is the point where we've really got to talk about that. The 114 is supplied with a primary mirror. In fact, let's just use a bit of show and tell here and actually show you a uh, primary mirror here. This is from a slightly larger telescope. This is from a 130 mil, but it, the principle is the same. So if you took this out of its cell, it would look very much like this. Um, the screws you see on the back there are actually to adjust the uh, telescope mirror. So the, the 114 is equipped with a mirror that has a spherical uh, figure on it. Really, that just means part of a sphere. The 1145P has a parabolic figure. Now, that's a more uh, exotic uh, um, uh, profile to the mirror. And the reason there's a difference between these two types of mirrors is that one actually produces, this is in very broad brushstrokes, produces a slightly sharper image, and that's the parabolic. If you ask the typical kind of forum, uh, fan forum guru, he's going to answer straight away, and he's going to say, oh, the parabolic is better spend the extra few pounds and, and get the parabolic. Uh, and I've got to admit, there's a certain amount of truth in that, that technically the parabolic mirror is better. Very briefly, the reason it's better is that the figure on the surface of the glass, the way the glass has actually been ground, it's got a slightly more exotic curvature on it, and more of the total light that falls on the mirror is brought to a good focus, so that you can actually see a sharp image. When you compare it to the spherical mirror, some of the light at the edge of the mirror doesn't quite make it to the image that you see in your eye. With the net result, uh, you actually see a, a tiny little bit of ghosting and, and um, glow around the target, so that not all of the light that's brought to your eyes in perfect focus. Now, that sounds dramatic when I put it to you like that, and you're gonna think to yourself, well, I'm gonna spend the extra few pounds and get the parabolic. You need to think again, because the parabolic instrument has a focal length of 500 millimeters, the spherical instrument, that's the 114, has a focal length of a thousand millimeters. Now, in my judgment, these, it's much harder to really define the difference between these two telescopes. If the telescope was a lot bigger, I'd probably go along with that judgment and say, yeah, of course, the parabolic is, is the one to go with. But with a smaller instrument like this, especially bearing in mind that the person you, who may be using it or that you plan to give it to or whatever, or if you're buying it yourself, probably has never owned a decent telescope before. And this may be the first time you've got something like this. It makes it a little bit harder to make the judgment. Let me just show you what I mean. Um, this is one of the uh, rather nice little eyepieces you get with it. This is a 10 millimeter uh, eyepiece, obviously it goes just up here. Now with the 114, the basic the spherical mirror uh, instrument, this eyepiece produces 100 times magnification. Use it with the Barlow and it produces 200 times. Now that's a lot of magnification, in fact the maximum magnification this telescope can achieve is only around about 220, 230 times. So to be able to get your 200 times out with just this one eyepiece and Barlow combination is really pretty impressive. But when you look at those, that same eyepiece that's supplied with the 1145P, you'll find that it will only deliver 50 times magnification on its own, and 100 times when used with the Barlow. So here's a big difference then. The parabolic uh, telescope, the 1145P, actually produces half the magnification that the basic 114 model does. 
So now you can probably see why I regard that as an important difference between these two instruments, especially as a new, new, new user. Now, you'll often see the buying of the parabolic recommended because it's only a few pounds more. What I would say about that is, um, if you're gonna cash in the difference between the parabolic mirror and the spherical mirror, then you probably need to consider spending a bit more money on a few more accessories. Because to be honest, you're not gonna cash in that difference unless you can level the playing field and produce a similar level of magnification between the two telescopes. And that's really gonna mean buying more accessories that are in, in the box. So although the difference on paper is only about 10 UK pounds, um, by the time you've bought the extra eyepieces that you're going to need, you're probably looking at a £50 difference between the two telescopes. I hope that's clear, because it's kind of a subtle idea, this difference between the parabolic mirror and the spherical mirror. So bear in mind, I'm saying, I don't think, for most people, you're going to see a huge difference. But do bear in mind, you are going to see a difference in the scale of the magnification. So if you're looking for a, a basic first-time telescope, I'm saying that the basic 114 is probably all of the telescope that you would need. And that about wraps it up for the Skyhawk 114 and 1145P. See you again soon, I hope. Bye for now.